The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hi right, guys, the pandemic rages on, but uh, the election is over, so that's super, super awesome. Uh, today we're excited to have Todd Pearson uh, from AirDB. Todd is the CEO and co-founder of AirDB, where he's been working on this since 20, 2019. Um, prior to that, he was the CTO and co-founder of Influx Data, we were the creators of, of Influx DB. Um, so again, as, as always, please, if you have any questions for Todd as, as, as the talk goes on, please unmute yourself, say who you are and where you're coming from. And always, we want to thank the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real for sponsoring this event. Okay, Todd, the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so yeah, so this talk is called Designing Systems for Cardinality and Dimensionality. Um, as, uh, as Andy mentioned, um, I'm Todd, uh, co-founder and CEO of AirDB. Um, yeah, happy to be here. And let me get PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, so quick agenda. So go into a little bit of history and background, um, talk about some of the stuff that I saw, learned, and did at Influx, kind of how it informed um, some of the some of the stuff we're building now, and some things that we think about as sort of ideal database properties that we want to be focusing on, um, and then kind of talk about what what AirDB is just a little bit towards the end. Um, I don't want to make it too too focused on pitching the product. It's more about the sort of philosophies that we've evolved over the last year and a half, and then talk just a little bit about sort of future goals and things that we're still working on, and and uh, stuff that we want to try and tackle as we as we grow. So yeah, a little bit of history. Um, I previously co-founded Influx Data, um, and when we when we built it initially, when we started the company, um, we weren't we weren't really planning to build a time series database. That wasn't the the goal. It was actually we were building a SaaS tool for observability and dashboarding, um, and we actually built a time series database as as part of that SaaS platform. So Influx DB actually came out of um, a lot of the a lot of the work that we did to, to build a product uh, that was that was going to need to leverage a time series database, we found a lot of the you know a lot of the things that we we tried looking at. I mean, this was an era when where most people were still using Graphite for observability. There was no Prometheus yet. Um, Datadog was was being built around the same time we were building this. So there was uh, kind of a, a lack of tools in the space. So we essentially pivoted away from the SaaS product and started working on. Um, InfluxDB itself in 2013, um, and it was initially uh, it was a bunch of just like Scala web services on top of Cassandra is kind of where we had started. And then we, you know, by the time we open sourced InfluxDB, it was we'd written it in Go, and we actually built the storage engine based on LevelDB was kind of the the starting point there, um, and gave us some some room to you know experiment and figure out what we needed, and um, we ran into some just growing pains with level DB and switch to rocks DB. And, uh, you know, it, it was good. It got, I think it got us relatively far, but we realized after a little while that we were going to need to build our own storage engine. And I know Andy, I think Paul did a talk, my previous co-founder Paul Dix did a talk about the, the influx storage engine, probably 2017, I think is, is when it was, but, um, it was a while ago. Yeah. So we, we started building the, the TSM storage engine in 2015. Um, and it's, it, I mean, it's gone through a lot of development, a lot of uh, productionization, but largely the, the design of that storage engine is, is still pretty similar to the way it was in 2015. It hasn't really evolved a ton since then. So a little bit about that storage engine, because that's kind of seeing, seeing the, the development of that and sort of seeing the problems that we ran into, the things that did well, the things that did badly, sort of informed a lot of the of the things that we're, we're looking at now and the things that we want to do with AirDB. So uh, the way that the storage engine works is it's kind of, it's like, a, like an LSM tree. Um, each, each individual series, each individual time series is, is a column um, on disk. So there are, there are blocks of those, but each, each time series is essentially a set of tags, a set of key value pairs, um, string key value pairs that, that basically represent um, a unique series that can be uh, targeted with a, with a precise set of tags. And then each field that you specify, and I don't know how, I don't want to get too much into the syntax of, of InfluxDB, but essentially you can write data that's either a, a Boolean, a float, an integer, or a string 
um, as a field that's identified by a given tag set. And those are stored in uh, compressed blocks that are basically you know, a column-oriented data store. Um, and that you know, works pretty well. It gets decent, decent performance. Um, and the, the query language sort of allows you to specify uh, sets of series to, to either query on or do aggregations on uh, by using an inverted index. So essentially, each tag has a set of values that, are, that have been written. And for a given value, for a given tag, um, that inverted index tells you which series match. So essentially, as you're, as you're running queries, you know, that inverted index tells you which columns need to be fetched from which blocks for whatever time ranges, and then it can pull those back. And it's, you know, it, it performs relatively well, um, but we, we kind of saw a few things as we started to get to larger and larger data sets um, that m made it a little bit tricky for certain use cases. Um, and incidentally, the, uh, <clears throat> the design, if anyone's looked at the, the storage engine for Prometheus, the, the, the storage engine that they wrote for Prometheus 2, originally Prometheus was in memory, but the current Prometheus storage engine is, is very similar. Like it took, they took a lot of the same design principles, but they simplified it um, so that only, it only stores floats. So there's no bools, ints, or strings in the Prometheus storage engine. But if you've looked at that, it's, it's, it's very similar the way it's structured on disk. Um, so some of the things we saw within FlexDB as, as people started to use it at larger and larger scale, um, the ingest performance was, was good, but it wasn't, it wasn't great. There were actually a handful of design choices that made it um, difficult to scale out. So one of those was, was basically, you know, in the middle of the right path uh, was a write ahead log. So it F synced to disk for, for durability, but there was essentially a, a hash map that had a single um, each, each series ID or each series key set of uh, tag keys um, was an entry in that in-memory wall. And so that was the, the in-memory portion was used for querying, but essentially it created a hotspot for write. So there was actually a lot of contention around that. Um, and at a certain size, those would get flushed to disk and then those would get compacted into the, the TSM storage engine. But it, it actually made it really difficult because the series... Uh, series ID is sort of like a, a write concept created a, a lot of contention when you had either a lot of series or some series that were getting written heavily. Um, and then we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, wrote InflexDB in Go and uh, garbage collection and some other memory overhead things of the, of the language actually created quite a bit of, of difficulty when we started to get to larger numbers of series, uh, larger, larger write volumes. Um, Another issue that we ran into is that because of the way uh, the, the concept of tags, was, it was a relatively simple way of saying, you know, if you write something that's a tag, it becomes part of the, the series ID, essentially. Um, but that's how data is indexed. So you essentially have uh, a series, uh, sort of a measurement, a set of tags that are associated with it. And if you write a tag, it's part of the global index. And if you don't, it's, it's, the, it's sort of a field name that represents uh, a column or store on disk. Um, and that was, that was decent. It worked, worked well for a lot of use cases, but it, it was having only a single way of indexing data was actually a, a big limitation. There was, there was no way of either building secondary indexes or offloading things from the primary index when you um, either couldn't, couldn't fit all the index uh, contents in memory. Um, another problem is that the index, as you started to tag series that you were writing in, um, you kind of had to decide at right time, is this, uh, is this attribute uh, truly uh, a tag that needs to be indexed, which is going to add to sort of that, the size of that global index, or is it a field that I want to store in, you know, in, in a column-oriented format that I can then query back? And you could filter against it, it's just you can't filter against it with an index. And so as, as an end user, as you're writing data, you kind of have to make that decision. You either write it as a tag or you write it as a field. And it's a, it's a pretty significant difference in terms of performance. If it's a tag, indexing is, is fast and easy. If it's a field, you essentially have to scan through those compressed blocks um, when you want to filter on that with queries. And then the, the kind of ultimate downside there was that um, as you make these decisions and you say, okay, this is a, this is a tag, I'm gonna, uh, it's gonna be indexed, um, if you change your mind 
it's very painful. Like it, this is sort of like permanently baked into the uh, the TSM files as you start to write this data. So there's no there's no easy way to say, oh, this thing that's a field I actually want to be a tag or vice versa. Um, type decisions. So if you write something that was an int and it becomes a float, you end up with essentially this um, like split brain problem where in some places it's a it's an int, in some places it's a float. You can have a lot of type collisions. And I think there were even some things that we had to add to the query language to say, I, I sort of accidentally wrote this in two different ways. I actually want to select the, the, the tag or field that is um, a float, not the one that's an int. So you kind of had to work around some of these problems. But essentially, the, the underlying problem here is that the data that you're, that you're wanting to store and compress and the metadata, the tags about the, the series that you want to be able to filter on are essentially very highly coupled. Like they, they coexist um, in the storage format and there's no, there's no way to modify that. And it's sort of as, a, as a, a, a negative, the biggest negative is that in a lot of cases, because uh, the way that these are, are indexed as like a single global index, um, if you happened to, as a, as a user, or even as an automated system, start writing data for a particular tag that has a ton of values, um, those values all contribute to the size of that global index. So maybe you write a tag that has 10 million unique values. Um, well, now you've written a bunch of this data that takes up space in this memory and you have no way of, of getting rid of it. So you actually can uh, blow up the indexes on, a, on an InflexDB machine uh, and then make it very difficult to actually get it started back up again. So there's not really any easy way to, to work with that data once you've gotten to a point of uh, having done something, something bad that you wish you hadn't done. Um, so anyway, there are, there are a lot of these things and you know, they, have, uh, they all have their, their solutions and workarounds and you can, you can introduce some tooling, but none of these were easy and they all kind of added, added up to be a painful user experience for a lot of use cases. Um, and so you know, kind of summarizing all those things, what, 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 do you, what did we learn from that? What are the things that I sort of took away um, as I left and was thinking about uh, what, what I wish we had done a little bit differently. So um, high cardinality data is, is hard to work with. And I'll talk a little bit more about the cardinality and dimensionality. But essentially, those tags that I was describing where you could potentially write um, or, or have a, an attribute that has a lot of unique values, that, that kind of, um, I think, to sort of estimate, I would say, once you have a tag with more than like a, a million unique values, you're definitely looking at a, a highly cardinal attribute. And that becomes very difficult with InfluxDB and a lot of other systems as well, because it's, it, it's trying to index something that has a lot of possible values. Um, metadata management is not easy. So in, um, in, in a lot of systems, you sort of end up with the metadata and data coupled or, or stored together in the same system. Um, and that can be very difficult when you start to want to extract um, metadata away from the data and be able to, to manage it or work with it without having to change the underlying data. And in that case, we're talking about InfluxDB, being able to convert, convert between tags and fields is, was, was basically impossible without doing complete rewrites of the files on disk. Um, and in InfluxDB, you know, it, it sort of builds itself as being schemaless because you don't have to define a schema, but you sort of have this um, situation where once you write data, um, it, a schema is sort of decided for you. It's, it's like a write time schema. Um, and there are a lot of unintended uh, restrictions that come along with that, especially in systems when you're not, there's no human in the path of, of the data, no human kind of looking at the data that's going in and deciding, is this the right type or should it be a different type? Um, and uh, more and more systems, I think, collect data automatically. Data you know, attributes can get added without users or developers realizing it. Um, and you, you sort of end up with schema decisions being made for you without realizing that they're being made. Um, and sort of as, a, like, as a, an extension of that, uh, working with data when you don't know the shape of it or the, the nature of it, and this you know, kind of going to a lot of systems that work with observability and things like that, you might be collecting data um, whether it's through a scrape or just through ingesting um, data that's coming in, and you're not necessarily looking at it all. So being able to uh, store that data and do, do meaningful things with it uh, can be very difficult when you don't really know what it looks like. And I think that's happening more and more as, as data volumes are increasing and data complexity is increasing. Um, and then just kind of looking at, you know, even the, the basic um, 
hash map that InfluxDB is using is sort of in the middle of the of the right path. Um, at a certain size, you know, traditional index structures can can struggle to to either perform or um, fit within the constraints of like a given a given memory profile. And you know, obviously, depending a lot on how you implement them and what language you're using. But there were a lot of times where um, doing things that should have been relatively simple um, became hard because of either because of Go's garbage collector or um, because of just the implementation decisions that sort of had to go along with it. So uh, at, a, at a certain scale, not everything works as well uh, as it does when you're looking at things uh, in a narrower scope. So we basically, as, as I left, uh, you know, I, I mentioned I went back to Pivotal for a while. Uh, I was working on some observ observability systems there. And we just, I started thinking a little bit more about how do you take some of these problems that we saw um, with InfluxDB, you know, obviously there are, there are things like, you know, sharding and, and strategies like that that can work for um, dividing up some of these problems that are about scale. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to find some better ways to solve them in a more, um, I don't know, a, a, in a bigger way that wasn't just about dividing the problem up, but actually trying to find some novel solutions. Um, and that's kind of what led to us uh, starting AirDB. And so we, my co-founder, uh, Robert, and I started talking about, you know, what are the, what properties do we want to try and find and identify in, in a database? Like, what are the things that we, we wish were just solved? And then, you know, upon that, you can build a lot of different, build for different use cases. Um, so we essentially said that, you know, looking at the way that users approach high cardinality data, maybe they're not even aware that it is high cardinality data or that, the uh, the number of attributes for a given tag is gonna gonna cause difficulty in in their system. Um, we kind of felt that should be something that just gets handled handled natively. Isn't something that should require user intervention uh, to to manage well or require uh, require users to you know reduce the complexity of the data or think about whether something uh, should be a tag or should be a field. There should be a way to um, store all that data and still make it. Uh, possible to, to query well. And then sort of as a, as a parallel to that, uh, we thought it should also be able to handle high dimensionality data. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide, but essentially data that has a lot of, a lot of columns or attributes, like not just a hundred, but thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Um, that should be something that users can work with effectively as well. Um, and we wanted to try and see something that was, was truly schemaless where, um, even if you wrote data uh, of two different types for a given field, um, maybe the data evolved. Maybe, maybe it was a mistake. Maybe there was just some uh, temporary period of time where data was, was written in a different format. We wanted to be able to let that data be stored, first of all, like let it actually be collected without being rejected as a write, um, but also make it possible for that data to be effectively queried and explored. Um, just because you have data that maybe doesn't have the same type over time doesn't necessarily mean that it was it was wrong or bad. So there should be some way to, to work with that data. Um, uh, being able to scale to large data sizes. So, you know, terabytes just aren't that big anymore. Uh, we wanted something that we could see being able to scale to, to petabyte sized data sets. Um, and then kind of fundamentally, you know, seeing a lot of systems out in the wild. We wanted something that could actually be uh, relatively straightforward for users to um, deploy and manage. Um, talk to a lot of people running things like Elasticsearch at scale, you know, like 40, 50 nodes. Um, and just seeing the amount of time and resources that are required to, to keep those systems online um, was something that we, we felt should be a, a solvable problem. And so uh, kind of getting back into the first two a little bit, I wanted to just come back to uh, these, these two things. They're kind of a, a dual of each other, cardinality and dimensionality. So cardinality, just kind of to recap, um, is the number of unique values for a given dimension. And so if you think about something like, um, like let's just say we're collecting metrics for a bunch of different, um, a different bunch of different VMs. Um, you know, the IP address, if you choose to, to index that, you know, let's say you have 
uh, 100 different IP addresses for a given deployment. So that would have a cardinality of 100. Um, and then as you start to add other other tags, like maybe there is a maybe there are three services running on each of those IP addresses. So maybe there's like a MySQL, um, a mail server, and uh, I don't know some sort of other like disk metric or something like that. So then, you know, if the system has a cardinality of three for each IP address, now your cardinality is 300 because each one of those systems will be paired with an IP address for the, for the data that gets reported. And you can kind of see as you start to add more dimensions um, and more, you know, individual systems, like let's say you have 32 CPU cores and each one of those gets reported independently. Well, now just for your CPU, you multiplied the cardinality times 32. Um, and a lot, uh, that happens a lot in observability systems and, you know, other systems in general, whether it's industrial IoT or even um, uh, distributed tracing or logs uh, and more and more the attributes that are added to this data grow and grow. So we see a lot of systems where, you know, without really realizing it, you've sort of gone from what maybe several years ago would have been a relatively constrained cardinality data set. And now uh, as you start to, to sort of get the multiplicative effect of all these different attributes, you realize that you're reporting, um, you know, millions or tens of millions of, of unique sort of time series under the hood, if that's, if that's the kind of data that you're collecting. Um, and it becomes a larger problem because depending on how you index this, depending on how you want to query it, you end up with a relatively large set of given possibilities for the data that you want to be able to, to filter and explore on. And so that's sort of cardinality in a nutshell. Um, and then dimensionality, as I mentioned earlier, is the number of distinct dimensions. Um, and so, you know, in, in my other example, if it's just IP address and service, you know, maybe you only have two different dimensions. But um, more and more, we're seeing these higher dimensionality data sets as well. And so, you know, higher dimensionality can lead to higher cardinality. It doesn't necessarily have to. But we see these two different things as sort of um, uh, continuing, continuing to grow both on their own, um, but they also have an interesting sort of interplay that I'll talk about a little bit more uh, in just a bit. So kind of talking about high cardinality um, and how we, some ways we could think about it, some ways that we can, we can solve it and sort of how it, how it feeds into our problem set. Um, and so one of the things that became a problem, um, and this is like less to do with, you know, just the pure, how do you store an index for this? Um, how much memory does that index take up? Like what does the inverted index look like? It's just fundamentally, like as you have a high cardinality data set and you think about um, influxes storage format, like I said, is, uh, it's, it's a column oriented format. So let's say you have this inverted index, you can, you can use that to sort of find the series that you want to look at or, or filter on. Um, and if it's a hundred series, that's cool. You can go find your, your hundred sort of compressed blocks and pull them back and, and do whatever aggregation or, or other, uh, you know, addition that you want to do on them. Um, but as that number starts to grow, as the number of series you pull back starts to grow, um, it becomes harder and harder to actually retrieve that. So sort of as a thought experiment, if you somehow, let's say the cardinality of your system is, I don't know, maybe a hundred million and you want to pull back 1% of those series. So let's say it's a one, 1 million distinct series that you want to be able to pull back. Well, each one of those exists as an independent column on disk. So they may be in, some of them may be in the same blocks, but within those blocks, you have to jump to each of those series to, to find them. So let's say each of those series requires uh, one, one seek for retrieval. And in SSDs, I know there's not like a seek, but there's still a sort of an access time. So let's say for an SSD, you can do it in a 10th of a millisecond per series and, and jump to each one of those to pull it back. Well, there's still a uh, hundred seconds of sort of uh, bare minimum retrieval time to be able to pull those back. And as you start to think about um, just sort of naively placing these columns uh, in, in blocks on disk, uh, it actually becomes a uh, performance limiting. Like you really get stuck actually retrieving the data because you have so many of these unique uh, columns on disk. And, with the way that a lot of, um, like with the way InflexDB's storage engine is, is designed, there's really sort of no way around this. So you'll see even if you have data that's indexed, um, as you start to pull back more and more series, it just becomes uh, still a very slow problem. So one of the things we started looking at is saying, well, you know, in worst case, like there, there's really nothing you can do about this if you are just sort of uh, using a, a generic 
column store. But what if we uh, think about some ways that we can actually group data together? So we started looking a little bit at um, using some machine learning classification and saying, uh, what if we actually find patterns in the data that we think make um, some of these series or some of these uh, data groupings uh, similar? Can we co-locate data so that maybe you're pulling back, you know, uh, a set of a of a, a thousand related entries or something like that at the same time? And it's uh, it's still early and still something that we're looking at. But uh, this is kind of one way that we wanted to approach cardinality and say, uh, what can we actually do to uh, to, to make some of these retrieval problems a little bit easier or a little bit more more tractable with the with the hardware that we're we're using, um, and so kind of jumping off of cardinality, I want to talk about before, yeah. So before you get away from that one, so yeah. like, the idea is what? So you're assuming that like people are running dashboards where the, the the queries are repeated, and it's just maybe like the the parameters that are used to look for different ranges may vary. So if you can then find uh, I guess clusters of 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 columns that are used together, you pack them together into like the same set of pages. Yep. That's right. Okay. And, and it could be, so some of it can be just purely looking at the data, like what, what data looks similar and some of it can be looking at the query. So what, well, like, can you build uh, patterns on the queries that users are running? So there are kind of two sides to it. Um, it's still kind of an area of active exploration for us. Um, but we found in, we found some, some, benefits that can be had by, by doing that, by actually grouping data together and making it easier to pull back like a larger chunk of data um, rather than a bunch of smaller chunks of data that are more, uh, that are yep. less tightly coupled. So I, I buy that like, okay, I, if I can co-locate co columns that are used together in the same pages, like that's a, that's, that's, you know, that's a known thing to do. But yep. so what do you mean by if, if the data itself looks similar? Like, cause you, you can then compress it better or what are you, what are you trying to do? Um, so looking at looking at data where like maybe looking at data that the uh, has has similar attributes has like the same set of repeated attributes or attributes that are clustered together in the same uh, I don't know value space um, and building building models based on that. But that, but that I mean to do what like just to do summarizations or actually like compress it better like, the same compress it better yeah yeah okay, compress okay, it okay. better yeah lo located in the same file and so and and some of this stuff I think to sort of step out a little bit we're not necessarily dealing with all time series data here like that's sort sure. of the, my background because of InflexDB but we're not necessarily saying uh, that all this data is even going to be put on a dashboard or things like that but yeah the idea is uh, better compression uh, is okay. kind of the the goal. But you, 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 you use the word model there, and that means something specific in the machine learning world. That, that, that's just for the classific classifier and yes. not like a summarization. Okay, right. That's yep. fine. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. You got it. Um, Thank you. And then, so s stepping into the sort of high dimensionality problem a little bit, um, we kind of wanted to think about how, how we actually uh, sort of con conceive of the data uh, inside of, of ArrayDB. And so as, as a really simple example, uh, here are two rows of data, uh, four different fields, and you know this is what you get from like a relational database, just selecting two rows. Uh, but what if we take it and we sort of exploded it into its uh, most highly dimensional form? So we actually, for each field and value, we have a single uh, dimension that's either true or false. Um, and so with with this uh, representation. Um, we actually can start to think about the data a little bit differently. And so uh, in dealing with this data, um, when we think about uh, being able to, to work with some of these dimensions, um, there are some tricks that we can start to uh, employ to be able to actually manage highly dimensional data uh, more effectively. And if we can, so we essentially said, what if we are able to uh, handle the highly dimensional case, which is uh, potentially a little bit harder and more complicated than handling just a purely uh, high cardinal space? Um, what what can we what can we do? What can we do differently? And so um, we kind of uh, let me jump to the next slide and, and kind of look, look at this a little bit. But so we said basically the um, exploded form of the data is is more flexible. And um, you, you now have values that are all mutually exclusive. And so by building a database that can work with this, 
we've sort of like encapsulated the high cardinality problem. So high dimensionality, if we take and think about each one of those possible values as its own dimension, um, <clears throat> lets us not have to think about any one particular dimension as high cardinality. Each one just has sort of like this Boolean representation now. Um, and we can actually use uh, some machine learning techniques that work on dimensionality reduction to start to look at this highly dimensional representation um, as, as a space of values that we can work with in different ways um, than just thinking about it as like a pure storage representation. So uh, kind of jumping off of that, we have started looking at, um, there's this paper, um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen it, but this paper from uh, 2017 came from a bunch of folks at Google. Um, Jeff Dean was, was one of the people on the paper. Um, but basically what they said is, Let's look at let's look at traditional indexes like a B tree, um, and let's let's see if there are some better ways that we can actually uh, model this data as an index that better reflects the the patterns in the data and could potentially uh, outperform uh, traditional index structures. So they looked at a bunch of different index types. B trees were kind of the ones that they spent the most time on, but they looked at um, like range trees and hash maps and um, uh, some like point point indexes, but basically uh, they took, you know, individual indexes, multi-stage indexes, um, and they essentially found that and one of the biggest, one of the problems they started talking about initially was that um, they started looking at this stuff just with Python and TensorFlow and actually found that the invocation overhead was uh, too high. So they, they built this thing called the index learning framework where they actually can build these models, turn them into C++ code that they can then um, run uh, directly and, and say, you know, how, how does the performance actually compare? So they sort of built a bunch of cool tooling around this stuff and looked at a bunch of different use cases. But um, here's one of the kind of breakdowns from the paper. But they basically found that if you, you know, compare some of these learned indexes that they're building, and there's obviously there's like different kinds of uh, search uh, algorithms and things like that, that you can use within this. But they essentially said there are ways that we can not only create an index where the lookup is faster, but we can build indexes where the overall memory requirement is smaller. So you kind of win on both fronts. Um, and they, they looked at, uh, I think in this one, yeah, so let me jump to the next one. So there, here's a chart. They, they had some uh, web log data um, and they had a, a log normal data set and they had another one that was kind of like just document IDs from a uh, um, sort of like a web index, but they looked at a bunch of different data types and sort of found um, that depending on the parameters that you tune with, um, you can actually get pretty decent performance out of this. And it was obviously like a very uh, early stage paper. And these were sort of, uh, some of these were synthetic data sets and, and things like that. There are obviously limitations to how far you can take some of this stuff. But we looked at this and we actually said, you know, there's some interesting stuff here. Like they kind of, um, you know, said, this is, there's, there's some promise here and they kind of took this in an interesting direction. So, you know, why does, why does any of this stuff actually matter? Well, we saw some places where uh, learned indexes can actually outperform traditional indexes and that's, that's interesting. Um, we've already been thinking about machine learning as ways to sort of figure out how we store data or retrieve data more efficiently. Um, but kind of going back to some of the things that I saw with the, uh, indexes at, at InfluxDB, being able to significantly reduce the size of indexes uh, is actually a, a big deal. Uh, and I think I mentioned earlier, but one of the things that we saw is, you know, once your index gets to a certain size, you actually see um, boxes running out of memory and crashing. And if you were able to apply some of these techniques to high cardinality data to reduce the index size, you could end up with um, some, some pretty interesting outcomes there. Um, and it sort of is going in this direction of like workload personalization. So you know, if you think about a, a generic database with generic indexes, um, th there is maybe some argument to be made that by uh, adapting to different workloads, you can actually make the database uh, more performant, make the index structures more performant. Um, the, one of the bigger things that they pointed out is that through building these models and training them, you know, NVIDIA is projecting a uh, thousand X increase in GPU processing power by 2025. So obviously if that's something that we're able to leverage, if that's something that's actually happening, um, being able to uh, build and use uh, models for these kinds of indexes 
is obviously interesting as GPUs start to outperform CPUs more significantly. Um, but the big takeaway is that you know they they showed some use cases and some sample data structures and some you know ways to to pair these things together. Um, but they you know kind of said th there's a lot of additional research that can be done here. This is just the beginning, um, and so we kind of took a lot of that and started thinking about ways that we could um, ways that we could use that inside of AirDB. Um, and so as we started thinking about it, and this is kind of Andy getting to your your question about you know super indexing and what is it, and it's it's sort of for us it's it's a, a set of um, it's sort of like a family of techniques that we think build on some of these um, some of these things that that other folks have, have uh, come upon. Um, and so one of the things that we started looking at is you know um, in in data sets like uh, the ones that we see in InfluxDB you know, you have to decide between a tag and a field. Well, what if, what if some of those field, uh, fields were actually still had some sort of other index on them? Is there a way that you can use some sort of a machine learned index to um, improve on just having to do pure table scans? Um, and, you know, can we use machine learning to build some of these um, membership structures for, for highly dimensional data? So similar to the way that you might use a bloom filter and LSM tree to figure out like what, what blocks are relevant. Is there a way that we can use um, some of these membership structures for this highly dimensional data that we kind of want to think about to identify um, which, which attributes, which dimensions matter, which ones are relevant to a, a particular query. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we can use some of these dimensionality reduction techniques to sort of bring down the, the space that we need to look at. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there's, you know, no free lunch. So while we, th we see that um, the learned index structures are interesting, there are definitely places where they uh, underperform traditional index structures. And I think one of the things that they pointed out in the paper was that, um, you know, you can still use these index structures, but fall back to a traditional index structure if you find that you're underperforming it or you find that it's not a good fit. So what we kind of wanted to look at is, is there a way that we can use this not as our only index structure, but as sort of a an extension to a lot of other things that you know maybe more performant in certain use cases? Um, but as a way, these like these this concept of learned index structures can help us to to be more performant in, in certain use cases. So, kind of as a test bed for this, um, we started working on a, a prototype, and we 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 said we just kind of wanted to get to a place where we could see some uh, progress with a, with a minimal time investment. So we actually started experimenting with Postgres because it has um, the index access method extension framework. So you can actually build sort of external indexes with Postgres that it can use to, to, to reach out to. Um, and we basically built this thing that we call the foreign index wrapper. And so essentially what it does is as writes come in, they get, they get written into Postgres, but they also get written to this um, service that we we wrote. So essentially, through sort of the hooking into the the write ahead log inside of Postgres, um, all of the writes get written. Sort of all the tuples get sent over to this external API that use this you know uh, learned index structure kind of idea, basically to to build uh, build indexes against all this data. And so rather than making it something where um, you know, you have to specify an index. We just took all the data and indexed every dimension that came through. Um, and so this, there was actually another project that I can't remember the name of that we, we found while we were working on this that had a similar, similar concept for the way that they did the foreign index wrapper. But if anyone's interested in talking more about kind of how we, how we built this and how we hooked in, um, feel free to hit me up afterwards because it was, it was kind of a fun project. And it's, it's not something I think we're going to, um, you know, turn into a product or anything like that, but it was kind of a cool way to, to leverage Postgres. Um, was, it, was this an academic project or a, or a commercial thing? No, it was an academic. It was, it, yeah, I think we just, we ran into it on GitHub. It might've been on Hacker News at one point, but I think it was relatively academic. I don't think it was a commercial product. Okay. Um, but yeah, I can, if you're interested, I can, I can send you, I'll, I'll find it and send you a link. Yeah, I'd be curious, um, yeah. So uh, go, going back to this, like, so, yeah. I mean, the, they have newer papers on the learn index where the, you can, you can adaptively update them, but like the original paper was, it was, was, read only were static, right? But you mm -hmm. didn't. And so you're proposing, I haven't looked at the newer papers that, that, that are maintaining them online. 
but in your case, you would still have to have some kind of sharding for like time ranges because you can't be updating the one that you've already trained. That's the, and that's the basic approach that you, you plan on going this like within a time range, like here's the, you know, you, you know, here, here, here's the learn index data structure that I can use for that time range. That's essentially what you're proposing. That's, that's one thing that we looked at, but we, we actually do have a design where it is, it, it's closer to the ones you're describing. I, I actually, I haven't right. read the, those newer papers either, but it's more along the lines of something that's constantly being updated. So okay. it's essentially con continually trained. But then also too, your previous slide said you, you wanted them to be, you're trying to do approximate set memory, or the actual previous slide for this, oh. before this. Yeah. Like you, like you don't want them to point you to the actual location of the data. You just want approximate uh, set membership. Well, yeah. And so I think depending on the, and, and some of this is, I'm going to show some of my weakness here on some of the implementation stuff. Cause a lot of that is my, my co-founder is a little bit deeper in the, in this stuff than I am. But, um, for, for some of this stuff, it, it actually, I think it, there's an intractability at a certain scale. Um, mm -hmm. and I think the approximate membership gets us, um, is a trade off between, you know, models that are, that are too large or indexes that are too large versus, um, data that we want to be able to pull back and can then look through at query time or at yep. decision time. Do you, would you want a balloon filter that does rain queries? Um, maybe. And that, I mean, I think that's sort of along the lines of, of the stuff that we've been, been building. Yeah. So we have one. Okay. Awesome. I'll, Neat. I'll email you. I okay. can email you for it. Yes. Yeah. Definitely be interested in, is that, is that a paper or is that just... Yeah, it's a paper. We won Best Paper Award for it too in Sigma. so... Of course you did. <laughs> it's the only time I've ever won Best Paper. No, just the student wrote it. The student... Juan Chen's awesome. He did it. Okay. I'd yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd love to read that. Yeah. Okay, send it sure. Over. All right. Sorry, keep, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then so, um, you know, this was a prototype. We, we didn't uh, go nuts with trying to make this something that was going to be... Uh, uh, like I said, we're not going to turn this into a product, but we kind of wanted to just see what it looked like with with some you know, real world data. But we basically found that, yeah, we were able to make this thing work. This thing is as sort of like a foreign index uh, worked and we were able to, so essentially what, what we did is said, um, if Postgres has an index, if the, you know, if the, the query engine finds uh, an index that, that matches well, it can use that. But if it doesn't, it ends up having to fall back to a table scan, uh, it can use this external index. Um, and so basically if we index everything, um, which in, in, you know, the real world is probably not ideal, but let's just say for the sake of the prototype that we index everything, um, we actually found that we could actually do a pretty good job of being able to improve on Postgres' just pure table scan. Um, and, you know, then this was a smallish data set. It was relatively um, restricted, but we were able to find some speed ups depending on the, the type of data that we were using. Um, and so it kind of gave us some, uh, gave us some optimism that there are ways that we could actually incorporate uh, this work from the, the learned index structures into AreaDB in a way that that allowed it to be not the sole index for everything, but uh, in addition for some of these, whether it's high cardinality or high dimensionality data, we could actually um, store and index that data and 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 make use of it. Um, and like I said, the, there were I think there's a lot that we could do there. Um, and if anyone is interested in talking more about kind of how we did it, just let me know because I, I thought it was kind of a cool project. Um, but there obviously are like limitations, like Postgres has its own limitations and it's not something you can, you know, use on AWS because you, you can't put foreign extensions in. Um, so it's got limited utility as a product, but I think it was, it was kind of cool for us. Uh, so moving on, talking a little bit more about schema -lessness, um, and just how we want to think about AirDB as supporting um, data without having to have, have a schema. Um, so <clears throat> one thing that we, and yeah, I was trying to decide on order of these next two slides. So essentially we started thinking about uh, how we get rid of the schema and kind of going back to um, InfluxDB and Elasticsearch and, and some systems like that. It's, it's sort of like air quotes schema-less, um, but there's still a like first write wins kind of scenario where you don't have to decide in advance, but once you write the data, that type is fixed and there are some ways to work around it. Um, but it becomes uh, it becomes kind of tricky, and then you you sort of have this um, consistency problem where you know you have to make sure that um, if a new series is being created, well you know is it the right type, and um, 
you know, there, there are some sort of race conditions around like series creation and first, first time that you've seen a column. Um, and it, it makes, it, it logically makes the system a little bit more complicated to, to deal with. Um, so we basically said, what if, what if any, you know, syn syntactically valid write was, was fine. Like what if it didn't matter, uh, whether the column existed or if it had a particular type, um, what if we essentially just said anything can be written as long as it's syntactically valid, um, and then thought about like kind of what that what that opens up for us and how, how do we deal with that if there are type conflicts? So we essentially came up with this idea where we're um, essentially every column, you know, air quotes column, um, can have uh, multiple types, and if it sees multiple types, those get stored separately. Um, but what you can do is say uh, each of those when at query time can be looked at independently and you can use some, some type coercion. So saying like maybe string one can be coerced to being the same thing as, you know, Boolean true or integer one um, and baking some things into the query engine that sort of are a little bit more flexible with how the types are handled at query time without necessarily uh, making there be a conflict when there, when there doesn't have to be one. And so obviously there, there are some things at query time that are not going to be able to be coerced in, into each other. Um, but there are most of the time that's something that's possible. And so we sort of have built into the query engine, the little of a query engine, the ability to handle these multiple types, um, even if the, it's the same column. Um, and so that's kind of the, the direction that we've been, been pushing towards and sort of came up with this, uh, I don't know, newer taxonomy of schemas. So we sort of have uh, at one end, the explicitly schema full. So, you know, relational databases, Postgres, you have to define a schema and everything has to, has to fit within that schema. Otherwise it gets rejected. Um, there's the implicitly schema full where you don't have to define it up front, um, but there is a decision at some, some point what the type of that column is. And, you know, I mentioned for InfluxDB, there is a way to write multiple types, but you, you sort of have to be very specific with how you work with them. Um, and in general, it's not, it's not actually very easy, e easy to interact with. And then sort of saying explicitly schemaless is sort of where we want to be at the far end of the spectrum where you can really write literally anything of any type into any field and <clears throat> we'll accept the write and at query time, we will handle that natively as part of, part of the, the query engine. Um, and we've kind of started looking at that as, as becoming um, an important part of our sort of like developer experience or user experience. Um, and it has kind of helped us think a little bit more about ways that we can extend the system and, and sort of design use cases around this. This is something that we can, we can support. Um, and then kind of that also feeds a little bit into scalability because um, by not having to have coordination around, uh, around types or having to, to make sure that, um, that rights are um, valid based on you know, previously written data, um, it's actually helped us simplify the right path in a way that, that makes it as uh, coordination free as possible. So we can essentially um, say that any right, as long as it is valid, can be accepted. And the resolution of any, any other conflicts can happen later at query time. But in general, as I've said, like we kind of have designed it so that queries will coerce types to make queries possible. And so essentially, um, we've made it easier for, for the right path to be scaled out. And really, the rights will only fail if there's some sort of you know, catastrophic failure, like you either have an entire part of the system down, um, but not because of conflicts on type or conflicts on anything else that an additional, any other user could do. Um, and so that's been an important part of us being able to scale this out to handle higher write throughput um, and make a system that, that's easier for us to, to build and deploy. And kind of through this, as we started like looking at use cases, talking to potential users, um, we've worked really hard to try and decouple storage and compute. Um, obviously, that's, we're not the first people to do that by any stretch. But looking at that as a set of use cases where we want to be able to deploy a lot of the stuff into a, a cloud native environment, um, being able to have the storage tier separated from the compute tier makes it possible for us to sort of build uh, build the separate tiers of the database independently and make them independently scalable. Um, and so that's something that where it ha has also become sort of like a, a guiding design principle is basically making these pieces independently independently um, 
uh, functioning. Um, and that also feeds into the next point, which is... Wait, so before, before we get ahead, sorry. I, I, yeah. I, we don't have much time. Um, is this really a good idea to, like, cause do people really want, like, I guess, like, like how do I say this? You're letting people shoot themselves in the foot, right? If they start putting garbage into a, fee, to a, a, a field, uh, you'll take it, right? And, like, you, you're not doing any integrity checks. Like, long-term, is that a good idea? Now, if it's, if it's metrics and sensor data, like, yeah, maybe who cares? Because it's like the, you know, you just feed, you're just feeding in this data from these different sensors, um, and it's it's programmatic. But like, long term, this is what burned a lot of people with the NoSQL stuff. This is what burned people on Codasil back in the seventies. Like, the relational model is 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 thriving and and, and sustainable for that reason that you that you have. Yes, you have to de declare a schema, but at the very least, like you could throw an error and say, well, you gave me a million float to this column, but now you're giving me a bar char. I don't think I want that and reject it. Yeah, and I, I think, so I think your, your point is valid. And um, I think there is a class of problems where data integrity is the most important part. Um, but I think there is a separate class of problems where uh, being able to have that flexibility is, is actually more important. So I think if you, I mean, thinking about, let's just talk about like structured logs. Like you're, you're dealing with a system where, I don't know, whatever, whatever your subsystem is, is, is generating uh, structured JSON logs and you just want to be able to store that stuff. Um, a developer makes a change that, like I said, changes a type or something like that. It goes from um, into a float. Should you start rejecting that? I don't, I don't know. I think there's a, I think there's an argument to be made that, um, you know, yes, garbage in, garbage out, but at the same time, whatever comes in, if you assume that there's some rigor around it and that you want to be able to make it possible to store and work with that data, um, mm -hmm. I think there is a class of problems where that's valuable. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly, yeah, you can let people shoot themselves in the foot, but I think I've seen people shoot themselves in the foot with sort of like intermediate schema type stuff also. Mm -hmm. um, and they sort of the implicitly schema full services. And I think for most of those cases, the end result would have been better if the system had handled it gracefully rather than started causing some sort of problem in the middle or starting to reject rights because, you know, somebody deployed a change. Um, so yeah, your point is fair. I think it's certainly not the right solution for every problem, but I do think there are problems for which it is a, a good you're, and interesting choice. You're, you're essentially robbing Peter to pay Paul. Like, like the writer does, is not paying the penalty, the, 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 the query it will, that we yep. need to read it back. Yep. Okay. That's, yep. that's, 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 that's a fair design choice, I understand. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate hi, your blessing. Do you, hey. do you ever uh, surface these conflicts to the user if they're, they're potentially doing it by accident? Mm. Um, do, you have, do, you, do you ever give feedback to the user that uh, perhaps Currently, this was no. unintentional? No, not right now. Um, it, it's an interesting choice. It's one of those systems where, or, or I guess one of those choices where, um, you know, is there, is there a likelihood that there is going to be a user even, you know, looking for these? Do we just dump it to a log? Like, is there just like a, I don't know, a conflict log or something like that where it at least gets recorded? Um, we don't currently do that, but it is, it is an interesting question. Like, I don't think it would be um, particularly difficult as long as that didn't have to fall on the right path. Like, I think being able to, avoid dealing with those conflicts at right time is useful, but I think there is a potentially a system where users could get alerted to those. But yeah, we don't do that right now. Good question. Um, so yeah, so kind of moving on to the final topic. I only have five minutes left, so I'll try and get through this. But um, operational simplicity is, is something that we've talked a lot about and talked to users about. And it's, you know, there are a lot of systems that are horizontally scalable but largely, you know, they, they come with significant operational burdens. Um, there are lots of, um, and I've heard, I've heard people complain about managing Elasticsearch at scale so many times that it's, you know, it's great that it, it works the way that it does and is, gives people the ability to, to scale out, but you end up having to do a lot of work to, to keep, it, keep it running, keep it online, manage node health, things like that. Um, and so well, one of the things we tried, again, to push for as, as a design goal is, you know, can we actually move to a world where we use something like object storage as, as, as our persistent storage? We, like every write 
is guaranteed to be written to object storage. There's obviously going to be, can be intermediate state, whether it's caching or, you know, uh, materialized views or something like that. But um, what if, what if you can actually make all of that intermediate stuff stateless? And obviously there would be a performance penalty if you just tore the entire cluster down and, and brought it back up. But um, can you make it possible to actually have this entire system be, be stateless and in so doing make it a little bit more, uh, I don't know, Kubernetes friendly for as much value as, as that has right now. Um, being able to run databases in Kubernetes is, is not great, but largely that's because you're, you're trying to do a lot of persistent storage on um, nodes or pods or whatever that, that want to be stateless. And so we've started doing a lot of work to look at ways that we can um, leverage object storage to be that, that persistent, persistent tier. We built a bunch of um, sort of caching technology and uh, sort of we, we built this service called the, like a, a treasurer basically is what we call it. And it kind of is looking at how, how frequently are you writing to object storage? Do you want it to be more or less frequent to sort of hit certain cost thresholds and um, being able to, to think about that stuff as a little bit more uh, of part of the database is something that we've, we've kind of taken on a bit more and there are going to be some performance trade-offs and, how it all integrates with things like the, um, you know, the machine learned indexes is all still part of the part of what we're working on. But um, as as a as a usability argument, it, it's appealing to users, I think, to be able to have something like this that that could work in this way. Um, so that's kind of our our final uh, thing that we've been been pushing towards. So if you wrap all that together, uh, what is ArrowDB? Um, so essentially, it's you know we, we talked a little bit about you know what is super indexing, and it's basically a set of you know novel data structures combined with machine learning to handle that high cardinality and high dimensionality data. Uh, the internal type type system that I talked about that basically lets you write schemaless data or data without having to supply a schema and lets those conflicts be resolved natively at query time. Uh, working towards a, a goal of being able to have all state stored in object storage so that you know, in the event that you need it to or want it to, um, that can be your your sole place, uh, sole source of truth, um, and everything else can be uh, reconstructed from that. Um, using, like like I said, I think earlier, using principles like Calm to try and get um, a, a coordination-free write path uh, and having near linear scale uh, as part of the design. And then I didn't really talk about this too much, but uh, we've tried to remain query language agnostic. We've done some work to build sort of an elastic search like DSL. Uh, we've done an integration with Drill to have an ANSI SQL front end, but essentially trying to provide a set of query primitives that allow us to work with a variety of query languages. Um, at some point we might have our own query language, but uh, I, I don't think the world needs another query language right now. So we're trying to stay, uh, stay uh, neutral on that. Thank and you. Then with my, yeah, you're welcome. Um, and then with my last minute, um, so kind of what, what's, what's left for us to work on? So, you know, we're building a database um, that I obviously will end up in production uh, for, for our customers. So production readiness, there are a lot of things, um, you know, back and restore tooling, um, even just deployment management um, all needs to, to come. And that's stuff that we're working on right now. Uh, finding more ways to leverage machine learning. I think the learned index structures paper is obviously, you know, it's an interesting direction, but there's still a lot more uh, to be done in, in basically um, every, every possible thing you can imagine within databases. I think it, it can be interesting. Um, cloud, cloud native storage, object storage has its, has its perks. Um, obviously not all object stores are created equal. So kind of finding, finding the ways that we work with, um, with, with everything in some sort of equal way. Um, even if the APIs end up being lacking is, is interesting, um, and then seeing more like how did how did things like learned indexes perform in the wild? Uh, you know, as we see more and more user data, we'll start to get a better sense for uh, where where it shines, where it, where it fails, and how we can do better. Um, and then looking at new use cases. I mean, obviously, my background is time series. We've done some stuff with that, some stuff with more traditional analytical workloads, but there's obviously a lot more uh, data out there. And uh, looking forward to tackling it all. And that is time. Awesome. Six o'clock on the dot. All right. So I, I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so we have a time for a few minutes for questions, if, if, if anybody has any. Hi, Todd. I have another question. Um, 
do you, uh, I'm assuming you have an API that people send requests to to write data. Mm -hmm. uh, do you guarantee that data is durable in object storage before you acknowledge the request? Yes. So right now, and that's something that we're working on. Obviously, there are the there are a couple of problems with that. One, if you do like if you trickle writes in, if you write one record at a time, you're obviously going to get severely punished uh, by your cloud provider for the cost of doing that. So we've got some work right now where we have sort of some batching thresholds and things like that. I mean, obviously, the downside there is that you have potentially higher write latencies. But right now, yes, we do guarantee that. Um, and that's something that we were thinking about um, potentially being being flexible for certain workloads. Like, do we want it to be uh, received by a sort of a write batcher or something like that and then, and then batch behind the scenes? But yes, right now, all writes are durable. Writes can potentially take a long time if you write small batches. And uh, related to that, do you, do you ever compact uh, small files in object storage if you get yes. a lot of these small writes? Yep, yep, good question. Yeah, so we do have some background compaction processes now. Um, that's obviously still uh, an area of active sort of research for us is what's the optimal way to do that? How do you, I mean, how do you decide what the optimal size is going to be totally de dependent on data? And, and some of that stuff is, um, yeah, yes. So yes is the answer. <laughs> So what is what is the new system? So the, the new system at this point is the, the, the farm data wrapper was just a prototype. You're building yep. a standalone like system that compute layer in front in front of S3 or whatever you're using it as the object store. Um, what is the new system written in, if not Go? Rust. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then the uh, is I mean it's still early. It takes a while about a data system, but like the current implementation of the Rust stuff. Does it have the, any learn index and stuff from now? It does, and it's it's something. So we we've been looking a little bit more at, at that being a a modular choice. Like it, it doesn't. We've got some deployments where we're using it, and somewhere we're not. So it's not something that is uh, required or necessarily used for everything. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, it is it is being used in some places. And then people are coming to you because they they. they Influx is not scaling for them, or time scale is too expensive, or, or, or what? Like, what, what is the use case? Are, like, are you seeing greenfield deployments, or are you, are you coming and replacing something that, like, that exists already? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, um, I think I, I said a little bit that um, we're not necessarily targeting like pure time series workloads. So, I think if you look at the space that you know, Influx DB is in, or time scale is in, it's a lot of observability data, and a lot, I think a lot of those use cases are shifting towards, or I mean, have been shifting Prometheus and, yep. and things like that that are a little bit more um, like native in the Kubernetes ecosystem or people are going to Datadog for things like that. So we're seeing, I think the, the stuff that we're seeing more of is less of the uh, like observability metrics and more things like um, distributed traces, logs, like it's stuff that's time series, it's fundamentally time series, but it's not the same kind of stuff that you would necessarily see in FlexDB handle. So some of this is, I think, Greenfield, some of it. Um, we're also seeing like people who are using Elastic for some of these use okay. cases. Like, there are a lot so, of people. So, so it's, it's more unstructured than like, what, what, you, what you would normally throw at time scale. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think I think to your to your question, I think there's it, it's a good mix. Like there's some Greenfield, but I think a lot of it is um, people who've chosen other systems, whether it's Elastic Search. And in, in, I think if you look at large Elastic Search deployments, I think there are a lot of places where we can. Um, deliver an improvement uh, over the Elasticsearch experience. Okay. And then uh, I guess the last question would be, um, what is the highest dimensionality of the data set do, data sets you're looking at? Like, like is it, you know, millions? Yeah, so we've been talking about dimensionalities in the millions. Um, okay. I think, yeah, I think if you, if you ask Robert and his eyes get all like twinkly, he's thinking like, you know, billions. But I think practically we're talking millions. Um, the goal is, you know, essentially making it making it limitless. Like I think whether it's cardinality or dimensionality, we kind of want it to be something that is um, not a constraining factor, but I think, you know, practically millions. And it blows up because you do that explosion thing where now you're embedding like the, like you, you turn the, you know, the, the fields and tags or whatever it was into like these, all these true false uh, attributes. Yep. And, that, and, and that's why it explodes. Yeah, and I, I think there's, um, 
yeah, and I think that that's part of the the stuff that we sort of that falls under the uh, under the super indexing label, and that's so that's kind of an active area of development for us is figuring out how do we how do we work with that data more effectively, mm -hmm. and how do we actually um, improve that improve that performance and just make it make it more of a practical real world tool that that hits more of these use cases. But I think you know at the same time we're able to work a lot more. Uh, we're, we're able to deploy a lot of other you know types of indexes and things like that as well. It's almost like you know, it's like you're, it's almost, it almost becomes like an array database. So I wonder if there's anything from the, from that world, like the Tau DB, SciDB to a lesser extent maybe, like, like you can leverage for how they store things and, and you know you can compress things better better than just column, straight column store. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I had looked at Tile DB a while ago, um, but yeah, I'd be interested interested to hear more of your thoughts on that as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, not now because I my the baby's screaming. I got to go do that. Okay. Oh. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's all right, Todd, thank you for doing this. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, this is very, very interesting. Um, and I think what we should do is after you've proven out maybe that the learn that indexes work and you have or, or don't or don't work, we agreed to invite you back and give another talk. Yeah, um, that'd be great. What yeah, you can learn from learn indexes. That's I like it. That's a good topic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd love love to come back, love to talk more. Um, yes. I think it's stuff that's that's super cool and would love to share more of our of our findings. Okay, awesome. All right, so again, thank you, Todd, for being here.